Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to welcome our online audience uh, in Singapore and also in our community, friends and colleagues in SUTD. Uh, again, I'm Rafael, Rafael Martinez uh, from the Liquid Youth Center for Innovative Cities at SUTD. And on behalf of my colleague Winston, Winston Yap uh, and the center, I would like to thank you for joining us for the reimagining of the urban in the post pandemic era workshop. So, our next panel, as you may know, is Health Awareness, a new civic duty. This is the third panel of day one sessions, is, uh, which in general is focused on revising the connections, re relationships, and interpretations uh, between uh, state and citizen in the post-pandemic or pandemic context. Today, uh, I'm honored to introduce our panelists. First, we have uh, Professor Ranjit Singh Rai. He is assistant professor at the Department of Political Science, University of the Philippines. And uh, we have, of course, uh, Professor Erwin Alampai, professor of uh, public administration at the University of the Philippines as well. I am thankful uh, to our panelists for taking time off their schedule to accept our invitation. And next, as we have been doing this since this morning, my colleague Winston will explain the modus operandi for this session. Winston? Thank you, Rafael. So um, for this session, we will proceed with a 30 to 35 minutes Q&A between <clears throat> the panelists and the moderator. And after this session, the rest of the time will be Q&A with the audience, where we'll pick up questions from um, the online participants. So online participants can submit their question via the Q&A column, or they can also um, raise their hand and they will be invited to voice their questions. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the time over to Rafael to kick off with the first question. Thank you very much, uh, Winston. So, uh... As you know, the title of this, uh, uh, of this panel is Health Awareness, the New Civic Duty, but we ask, uh, this is a question. So let me give you a background uh, and then I will give uh, a starting question. So to discuss with Professor Chalampai and Raji. So COVID has uh, prompted increased uh, health awareness. People are more conscious about hygiene and taking necessary precautions to protect themselves and their loved ones. Yet, some argue that all habits die hard and people will revert to pre-COVID health standards. So the first question I have here is, how has citizen health awareness changed in your city over the past year? And, uh, and a follow-up question is, is health awareness a new symbol of civic duty and being responsible to one's country? Let me repeat the questions. So how has citizen health awareness changed in your city over the past year? And second, is health awareness a new symbol of civic duty and being responsible to one's country? Who would like to start? Professor Ranjit, perhaps, or Professor Alampai? I, I can I can start. Very good. Uh, I think I think health awareness in the Philippines in general has, parang, uh, has fluctuated in a in a way. Uh, if if you're talking way way back, like it, yeah, I think to a certain extent, uh, government in a way also has influence on the awareness of citizens. I remember uh, during the early early 90s, I believe, during the time, or, or the late 90s, during the time of President Ramos, one of the more dynamic health officials was uh, Senate, um, then Secretary Juan Clavier. And during that time, he had a 10-point program, and one of his programs was mass vaccination, mass uh, anti-health uh, smoking campaigns, et cetera. And it really increased the, the awareness of health among people. So smoke, smoking policies were reduced, people were uh, took up um, vaccination, et cetera. It then moved forward a couple of 
uh, years during the time of uh, Aquino, uh, there was a there was a an issue about uh, dengue vaccination, and a lot of people had a negative um, idea about vaccination because there were when 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 dengue vaccines were rolled out uh, later on they found out there were negative uh, negative uh, side effects that could happen to people who haven't had uh, dengue. And of course, move forward to, to, to now, uh, I think Filipino, uh, Filipinos who haven't had uh, prior experience to pandemics, of course, or, epi uh, or, or disease, airborne diseases, are starting to become more aware with respect to proper hygiene in terms of uh, mask wearing and hand washing. So I think to a certain extent, the health awareness of citizens. Also, um, part and parcel uh, reflection of what's happening during that time is also, I think government also has a large role in it. I, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. I'd like to echo the position of uh, Professor Lampay that you know, health awareness uh, has been and continues to be an important issue for uh, Filipinos. Um, the pandemic has heightened awareness. So that's the first uh, first thing that I'd like to emphasize. And it's also what is emphasized by Professor Irwin, that in the past, maybe uh, the awareness was not as high as uh, uh, it is now. Uh, we're lucky here, uh, Professor Irwin and I are part of a group called Okta Research, and we've conducted a first quarter survey of 1,200 uh, adult Filipinos. Now it's, it's a very robust survey. And, and and basic things that we, we we came out with is that uh, six out of ten uh, Filipinos, okay, um, uh, see that it's the first priority is to be healthy, and to uh, protect themselves against COVID nineteen. Another finding we found out was uh, uh, eight out of ten Filipinos practice minimum public health standards. That means wearing of mask, uh, practicing social distancing, uh, uh, yeah, practicing proper hygiene, Na and, and, and of that. Of that, of those minimum public health practices, 90% of Filipinos, adult Filipinos, that's across the country, uh, wear fa face masks. So this is an unprecedented, uh, you know, increase in awareness. No? Um, and, and 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 it goes further. You no, know? seven out of ten Filipinos, or eight out of ten Filipinos, understand uh, what are the health and COVID responses made by government. And of the responses made of government, 70% of Filipinos approve of the government's response. So there is an incredible awareness among Filipinos now uh, because of COVID. And maybe that's the major change. And maybe this is not so uh, surprising because um, COVID is primarily a health crisis. Um, a second thing that we realized uh, in our first quarter survey is that only two out of 10 Filipinos, less than about 20% of Filipinos, were willing to get vaccinated. The large majority, uh, well, not majority, but a, a significant minority, about four, close to 50%, uh, were at that time, the, the survey was conducted January to February or the early part of this year, the first part of this year, uh, about 46% of Filipinos were not willing uh, to get vaccinated. Of course, this is way before uh, vaccine started rolling out in March of this year. And we're hoping to run another national survey uh, this year. So to, to answer your question, are we more aware? Are Filipinos more aware of uh, uh, health no? as a, an important, important, urgent personal concern? The answer is yes. Uh, and, and COVID has a, has a large role to play. And we had played a large role in that. No? Now, as to the question about uh, is, it, is it the new... Um, is it now tied to uh, or the new symbol of civic duty? Um, the, the government campaign against COVID did not really uh, focus on that kind of message. That's the unfortunate part. And um, the, the focus on the nation uh, and civic duty um, was never really the, the, a strong point as far as the, uh, the national government's uh, early response and early campaigns against COVID. The communication was focused on the individual, protecting his family. Uh, but later on, I think um, uh, it, it changed and, and largely also because of the role of the private sector who, who started the, the conversation around uh, the argument that what you do as an individual 
was far more important than anything government has done in the fight against COVID and in preserving not just your family, but your community and nation. So the, the private sector will play the key role. And, and, and with the, with the you know, advertisements for their products, they, they, um, they linked the idea of, of uh, your individual role uh, as a form of patriotism and civic duty. Of course, government, uh, government uh, messaging has improved uh, so far. But again, it's not fully emphasized that what you do is an act of patriotism. Uh, the focus has been uh, how, you, how your individual acts will prevent you from getting COVID. So I, I think uh, that is now an emerging discourse and an emerging uh, discussion in the Philippines and uh, a consciousness of self, community, and nation uh, in the midst of COVID has also increased. And, and so if there's, you know, COVID has been a trauma for the country. Uh, like, in, like many other countries, it's been not just a health crisis. It's been a great social and economic disruption on the lives of people. It has cost lives no, of, of our countrymen. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's left an indelible trauma on all of us. But one of the things that, have, that has uh, evolved no, from the experience, apart from a greater consciousness, is the, the, the sense, okay, uh, that uh, we need to work together, that what we do as individuals is as important as anything government does, and that uh, civic duty you know, versus selfishness versus, let's say, civic illiteracy, meaning um, you know, acting as an individual against the interest of the community uh, has become uh, a much larger and uh, more... Uh, uh, you know, broadened issue and, and, and it's now in the consciousness of uh, many Philippines, especially those living in cities. Uh, now there's a consciousness that what you do doesn't just affect you, you and your family, but it affects the whole community. Uh, and, and this kind of uh, civic literacy uh, was expedited really by, uh, by COVID, the trauma of COVID, the disruption created by COVID. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you a lot for the um, insights. And it does seem like people's uh, health awareness has improved and also the way that um, they have started to perceive uh, their own health awareness as part of a greater communal good. So this leads us uh, naturally to the next question where as health professionals, you know, we've been through a few pandemics and there's this saying that old habits die hard and how do you think people will behave in the post-pandemic era? Do you think like people will stick to higher standards of health practice or do you think like they will go back to the old normal as they have been accustomed to in the past? Yeah. So maybe for this time, we can start with Professor Ranjit. Well, uh, I, I think it's very hard to go back to the old normal, you know, um, uh, I think wearing face masks are here to stay. Uh, that's not to say that there's a there's a minority uh, in the country who still uh, do not conform. You know, when we look at our surveys, uh, a, a significant number between ten to twenty percent still do not use the the uh, masks, face masks, no, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, when you look at the data on social distancing, for example, across the country, uh, six only six oh, close to seventy percent, only seventy percent do it on a regular basis. So when you when you look at the minimum public health standards and you look at the frequency of doing this, the data shows that uh, uh, not, all, not all Filipinos uh, actually practice social distancing or are able to do uh, proper hygiene for many reasons. Uh, but wearing face masks is, uh, it, it, you know, is, is frequently uh, used and most Filipinos uh, wear it on an everyday basis. So to answer your question, I, I don't think we will go back to the, uh, the old normal. Um, but as to how we will respond uh, in, the, in the new normal with regards to heightened health awareness is, a, is you know, it's a product of uh, a confluence of other factors. One is we really need in the Philippines to have a, you know, a stronger, a, a, a better discussion of where to go as far as reforming our health system is concerned. Uh, one thing that was uh, exposed uh, by this uh, pandemic, you see the weakness of the Philippine state. Uh, both at the leadership and institutional level, uh, where they're looking at response, although most Filipinos agree that and, and approve of the government response, 
uh, in the academe, all of us looking at it, uh, we're very critical of government's response. It's been inadequate. It's been um, uh, reactive. And in at certain points and junctures in the experience we've had last year, it, it was downright inappropriate and cost surges. So uh, uh, we feel that government response at, uh, as well as the reality that the health system is weak and that has been exposed, especially community health. No? And of course, the quality of our workers that are uh, in, the health, in the health sector, we need more and more. Okta came out with a model that we published uh, uh, and, and we submitted to government that became a guide for them. We found out that you know beds and ventilators are one thing, resource maximization is another, is one thing, meaning adding beds and ventilators, but really hiring more health workers and taking care of the existing health workforce is another. And, and, and that's a serious question in, in the Philippines, whether we will continue uh, these health practices and this awareness will also be a product of how we are going to reform or start the reform of our health system uh, moving forward. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the COVID response has been really a, 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 a significant uh, crisis for us. And the civic engagement against COVID has been one of the reasons why we have uh, dealt with the surges we've had. We're just in the midst of getting out of a surge, a very, very serious surge as we speak. And what won it for us wasn't really government response. It was really civic engagement. Uh, whether it's at the community level, the, uh, the private sector initiatives, uh, government played a very little, national government in general played a very, very little role in the response. What uh, the, the level of government that responded very well was local government, but local governments could not achieve it without the help of civil society. So a, a new thing that comes into four is the idea that COVID response is not just resource maximization, it's also governance maximization. How do we improve collaboration? How do we improve coordination? How do we improve the link between civil society, the private sector and government when we deal with crisis? Right now, uh, there is a greater um, sense that we need to work together, that COVID is a collective responsibility and that if surges happen, it's a collective failure on all of us. And I guess there's a, the greater sense of that now. Uh, and maybe that's one way of, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a key issue for the Philippines. Uh, reforming institutions, strengthening processes, improving governance. Great. Uh, Professor Win, how do you think uh, people should behave in the post-pandemic era? Well, well uh, there's two premises there. First question there is, uh, how do you know it's already ended? Now, when, when is the end? Uh, and unless, unless people know or can foresee where that end is, then I think people will stay careful. And I think that's related to the idea of how confident are you of your government? So it may vary from place to place, uh, country to country and within countries even. Um, in the Philippines, I think to a large extent, a lot of what, what Professor Ranjit was, was talking about was that um, civil society tends to complement the shortcomings of government, uh, whether it's putting up community pantries or uh, feeding uh, other people to help them or to give um, resources that government cannot do. So to, to a certain extent, if, uh, if you are not confident of the resources or in this case, healthcare system that government has, then I think to a certain extent, as an individual, you try to make sure uh, to be safe, to, to, to continue to practice whatever things you are, you think will keep you safe. So for instance, even though the government would have quarantine protocols and say, oh, it's, it's safe. But if you feel it's not safe, then you will stay at home. Okay, so people might still continue to stay at home or people might still be, if they are not sure their neighbor is practicing good health care, then they would still practice mask wearing just to be sure, just to be safe or minimize their travel. So you, 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 you'd, you'd, you'd see that in terms of how people are, the mobility figures, for instance, from country to country. I think that also is a reflection. Uh, the idea that I'm not moving around as much is also already a, a, a sign of, of 
health practice, a, pra a sign of citizenship because you don't want uh, cases to spike. So, so for me, I think uh, people would still practice uh, good health uh, practices in large part because it's their contribution, especially if they think government is not doing enough. So sometimes they do it on their own. So that's in, in, in the Philippines, in, to a certain extent, that's also why the Philippines has such a large, thriving, non-governmental organization. It's not so much they're against government, but it's to, it, they provide services in parallel to government. On the other hand, sometimes government takes it as, a, as a, something else. They distrust non-governmental organizations, thinking, thinking they undermine. But uh, like, like uh, Professor Rai was talking about, you, you could see it consider it as an optimization of governance that, that each has a role, even individuals have a role in, in making sure that uh, health is maintained. I'd like to add something more, you know, a professor, a professor um, Alampay touched on something that I, I, I failed to, to emphasize, you know, when, when you know, uh, surges happen, uh, epidemics happen. It's uh, you know, uh, but it's governance, bad governance in general that exacerbates. And when people feel that there's a minority that gets away, for example, with uh, with a selfish behavior, with not practicing minimum public health standards, you know, uh, in a sense, legitimacy becomes an issue. It's very hard to practice this, especially in a metropolis like Metro Manila, where uh, it's so hard because of the density. To uh, establish social distancing, uh, the the reality of poverty and uh, our, 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 you know the labor structure here requires you to work on a daily basis. All of these, there's so many challenges to trying to uh, be uh, healthy and to keep yourself uh, uh, protected from COVID. And if you see your government wasting money, uh, uh, focusing on the wrong uh, uh, projects, uh, incentivizing. Uh, uh, what you call this, uh, 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 negative bureaucratic practice, you lose confidence in government and you lose confidence in governance. You tend to take things on your, so that's the reverse. Now, good governance helps sustain a, a, a proper response against COVID. Bad governance exacerbates and, and forces people to think of themselves, no? to act in ways that we, could, we, can, we can say civic illiteracy, selfish, self-serving, not thinking of the community or the group. Uh, we saw this also with enforcement, you know, uh, in many cities that we're helping right now, uh, enforcement and monitoring is, is problematic because some cities permit certain types of behavior to exist uh, that are contrary to public health, like uh, bars and clubs. Uh, they don't monitor the wearing of face masks. So a, a lot of it has to do with the individual, but the government plays a key role in trying to sustain these uh, wellness practices. So that's why we prefaced it. It's important to look at institutions. Uh, although agency is important, institutions matter in sustaining uh, a, a proper response uh, post-COVID uh, as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Very good. So let me, let me move on with the, another question for, for you, professors. So what can be done to make people more responsible for their own health? and those around them. I mean, you have mentioned many things, many ideas, and I think, uh, but uh, how about if we try to standardize those ideas? Because, I mean, uh, Manila is a big city, as you said, and uh, probably there are differences in different parts of Manila. Um, maybe the richest uh, part or the wealthiest uh, part of the city might not feel the same like in other parts of the city. So, uh, so the question is again, what can be done to make a people more responsible for their own health and those around them in general, like uh, in a massive way? Uh, let me take the answer first. Yes. It's an interesting question because uh, I remember uh, sometimes when, when there are spikes in cases, government would say uh, citizens are not following. Yeah. or not doing enough okay i think from the context from from the context of the citizen you have to also understand it in terms of are there parang systems or institutions in place to allow us to follow that system yeah. so i think uh we have to have systems in place 
to help people uh, comply or practice. Okay, so one one system would be, of course, the the public transport. Okay, Are, is there enough public transport that would help citizens get to where they have to go in a safe manner? Okay. Uh, I remember at, at the at the beginning when when they had lockdowns, and then there was no public transport, and people started to be to be grouping together in long lines and long queues. So you're not actually encouraging it, but it's not the citizens' fault. It's because there's no system in place to allow them to go to wherever they have to go, or you have lockdowns and yet you don't feed people, so you can't expect people to stay. So it, 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 my 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 point is. Uh, if you want people to practice good health behaviors, whether it's wearing masks, for instance, in the beginning, you want them to wear masks, but there's no mask available, or you, you require them to, to not ride in a, in a tuk-tuk or a tricycle, uh, thinking it's not safe, but what's your alternative? Okay? Or you even prohibit people to go out in a public space. And then what about uh, health, health wellness? So I think it's not as simple as making people, how do we make people comply? But I think uh, the institution, government especially, has to make put in place um, the mechanisms for people to, to comply. If you say, okay, everybody should get vaccinated or everybody should get tested, and then they can't afford testing. How do you expect them to get tested? Or how do you expect them to go to a, to isolation ward when when they they feel they need to, to earn a living just to to eat. So I think it 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 it, it also the, the question has to go back to what should the state or what should the government have in place to make sure people are able to sustain uh, proper health uh, practices. You know I agree with Professor Alampay. Uh, there has to be a minimum basic structure for public health down to the community level uh, uh people will 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 do their best to keep themselves healthy uh but, but but the state has to come in to provide certain um minimum basic needs as far as health is concerned yeah, but a, a second thing that uh we would like to emphasize is the education is and awareness is important uh that you know uh government has to come out with education uh, campaign and it has, no? and, and at the community level, there has to be some sort of campaign to inform people about the importance of wellness and about the access to health at the community level. Right now, that access, um, you know, it, 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 it's so weak, no? it almost doesn't exist no? uh, in, in many places, for example, in Metro Manila, where majority of the COVID cases are. Third, you ask people to wash their hands, to do proper hygiene, when a, a big chunk of the city, a big chunk of the citizens are not even ad, uh, no, uh, accessible to potable water. I mean, these are real problems in Metro Manila. A big chunk of the population are not even accessible to uh, uh, a uh, sewage system or a uh, to potable water. So how do you do that now? You, you want them to be responsible for their health, but there are no public wash places. Public comfort rooms are are, are, are are very few. And in the depressed communities where a lot of people uh, slums, a lot of it, there's hardly any running water or uh, facility, okay uh, for sewage. So so this is a big this is a big uh, challenge as far as uh, uh, people will sustain good practices if they're accessible. Okay, uh, to institutions, to services, to resources that will help them sustain that kind of behavior, uh, and that 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 means even um, uh, rethinking so many things that we take for granted in the city. For example, I was talking uh, two days ago to the president of all the restaurants in the country. And their basic uh, beef with our group is that we keep uh, asking uh, the government to be careful about opening restaurants because they they can create events that will cause transmission. Uh, and now that the discussion with us was, maybe we have to re rethink the design of restaurants from indoor restaurants to let's say more al fresco for the next few months uh, to sustain the industry. So for example, or, or provide incentive systems or incentives for people who are vaccinated to go to restaurants. Vaccination itself is a very, it's a major issue 
in in the Philippines and 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 uh, right now as far as hesitancy is concerned only 20% of uh, Filipinos want to get have themselves vaccinated as per our survey in the last in the first quarter that's been January and Feb we're hoping that that will improve okay but there's a 9 or 10% segment of our population that just don't believe in vaccines at all they don't think that vaccines are the solution so these are the anti vaxxers people who do not believe in vaccines as a as a way forward so again uh you know th these are the issues that we, we need to inform people uh we need to make them aware of the importance of vaccines and and help them make a choice i don't believe in uh, pro proposals of our government to mandate especially the very poor who get entitlements from government uh to get vaccinated i'm against that i think pe pe people's choice is important and the freedom to choose uh, is significant in this particular discourse. So these are the things that uh, I, I feel will help uh, uh, what you call individuals sustain uh, this kind of practices, strong institutions, uh, resources being given to them at the community level, and third, awareness and education, especially with this issue of vaccines. Vaccines now are being tied up to patriotism. For the first time, the act of citizenship is being linked to vaccinations. But uh, only now, after uh, more than uh, a year of uh, dealing with COVID. Very good, uh, Professor Ranjit. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me go to, uh, we have another question. This is actually, you have already touched many points of that. But uh, I think it, it will be interesting to see this from uh, a different perspective. Let me explain you uh, which perspective. So the question is, what role can the government play to promote health awareness and what else should they do? I know that you just mentioned that, but uh, I, my question is more from the point of, from the spatial perspective. For example, we know that uh, the, there is the barangay level, we know the city level, but um, we tend to think it like a, it's a pretty much the same everywhere. So if you imagine, the, what will be the best way for the government to address these issues from the most like a basic units? Where do you do, do you can you think about any possibility to improve that or to, to promote health awareness more effectively if uh, the government is from uh, from the most basic uh, uh, perspective of, of government unit perspective? Or uh, yes, the uh, uh, Professor Erwin or, or uh, I, I, I'll, I'll answer that. Yes, so, yes Professor. There's, of course, like you said, there's many levels to to healthcare. The in the primary healthcare system in the Philippines is devolved to the local government units. So at the very uh, lowest level, we have the barangays. And we in the barangays, there's a somewhat uh, you could quasi volunteer network called uh, barangay health workers. So within that small unit, the barangay health workers are the ones that go house to house. Yeah. And they literally know everybody. Okay. And I think to a certain extent, recognizing the power of that that unit, that basic unit. Of barang especially the most, uh, if you think about it as uh, frontliners, barangay health workers, they are a very powerful uh, motivator of health behavior, and usually they are the ones who educate, they are the ones who monitor, they are the ones who report. Okay, and and they know who's sick, who's who, what the situation are. On the ground, and I think when 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 the pandemic happened, I think we we didn't utilize that too much. We we centralized a lot, and sometimes we duplicated by saying we should do contact tracers, etc. When we already have a very uh, large network on the ground, I think what's missing is actually the the information systems for integrating all those different levels of government from the base, most basic to the city to the national and. Uh, at the, at the city level, of course, the ne next aspect is, of course, the different aspects like uh, whether it's testing, okay, and then of course the, the other aspect is hospitalization, and that's where, of course, the larger levels of government come in. 
But the, the more basic ones, if you're talking about citizen awareness, about health practices, I think the most basic unit has a large role to play in that. And they are, in fact, I think the ones who know the real situation on the ground. And I think maybe Ranjit could share some of his experience because that's usually the dynamic from the lowest they see it in a more granular manner in local governments would, would sometimes criticize uh, national government or even OCTA saying that what they see on the ground is different from what's being reported at the yeah. national. Yeah. Uh, you know, I uh, you know just to build on what uh, Professor Alampai has uh, suggested. Um, well, well, government has a lot to do. You know, we we start we prefaced our initial discussion by saying uh, much of the work has been ramping up resources, but not really focusing on the fundamental problem, which is the weakness of the state. And the weakness of the state is in institutions, as er Professor Irwin was saying, in the most lowly. Uh, levels of government, the, the levels of government that have been left to fight this pandemic head on is also the weakest institutions as far as governance is concerned. They lack resources, they lack manpower, uh, and so much responsibility has been thrown at them. And, and it's, it's almost heroic what they've been doing over the last uh, year or so, just really uh, holding the fort as far as communities are concerned. But you know, a lot of them have been overwhelmed, and and we realize that uh, what else can government do to improve awareness? We strengthen these uh, institutions because these institutions are de deal with educating uh, uh, communities, households about uh, awareness. We also need to strengthen institutions at the national level uh, that deal with science, with pandemic response. With you know, we don't have a, a center for disease control in the in the Philippines. What we have are small bureaus that were wholly inadequate for dealing with this uh, pandemic, both in terms of surveillance and both in terms of educating the masses in terms of uh, awareness. So we need to improve on that. No? We need to have a stronger link between government and uh, universities, because this is uh, something that we, uh, will help uh, health awareness. And, and the, the general, uh, the, the general uh, what you call aware campaign uh, for um, prevention or for what we call universal health, has to move forward in the, in the Philippines for health awareness to to really uh, hit uh, the household and individual level. It's it's uh, uh, the the per capita income a uh, per capita expenditure for health in the Philippines is a joke. I don't even want to talk about the amounts. No, uh, uh, the the budget for health, for example, is not a priority. Uh, before COVID, it was not a priority. It in fact, for the last ten years, it has been declining. So again, if you want to increase awareness, you have to strengthen the institutions that make awareness possible. And that has to be a, a, a seen not as a cost, but as an investment. Strengthening our healthcare system, uh, improving local uh, community healthcare uh, institutions. Uh, we need to focus on institutions and processes, and we need to allocate resources for this. This won't happen overnight, but over time, uh, if there's a concerted effort, I, I think we, we can overcome uh, our institutional weakness as far as this is concerned. Because health awareness is a function of the weakness of the health system. And, and government has paid lip service to healthcare reform over the past few years. Congress, on the other hand, has taken a, a more progressive stand of, stance over the last decade, whether it's reproductive health, whether it's the universal healthcare, but these are largely unfunded mandates, meaning government has not given the budgetary allocation to privilege these advocacies, these mandates. And uh, that's why I'm saying it's lip service. We now have to take uh, institutional reform in health seriously. If we want to increase awareness, we need to build those institutions. I, I just wanted to add something to my earlier statement. I think another aspect, especially, especially in, the, in the context of the Philippines is um, the digital divide. Uh, yeah. We assume that everybody has access to um, smartphones, which is to a certain extent true. Um, but in, with respect to the pandemic, for instance, uh, in 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 Quezon City, for instance, we've 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 started vaccination, and part of vaccination was using apps, uh, and there was no take up, and largely because the the poor couldn't understand how to navigate registration, even yeah. though. Uh, a lot of them know uh, you could be vaccinated. So there's, uh, in the context of, of using the, the healthcare system, some places actually did house to house. They went house to house, informed people, this will be your schedule. So it's, an, it's a non-ICT intervention. And 
it was a more organized manner. Okay, largely because I think part of the divide is even if you have access to ICTs, but you don't add, actually understand the uh, navigating the services there, then it's no use. I mean, the technology is no use. It, it doesn't motivate people. That doesn't make people more aware. The other aspect I wanted to talk about was that even if you have access to the device, sometimes the information that you get <laughs> yeah. or push to you are wrong. Okay, yeah. so I, I know a lot of people who, who talk about alternative kinds of interventions, alternative kinds of medicine. And hence, I go back to, to, to what I said, Balangay Health Workers. I think they are the more trusted ones. If they yeah. could be given the right information, they could also convince people a lot easier because they know the, the people there. Okay, they could tell them what works and what doesn't work, what is uh, validated, what is, what is already uh, sanctioned kinds of interventions, where to go, etc. Uh, so people might have devices, but they might not be able to go to access or access the proper services. And even just teaching that, I mean, you could have Barangay Health Workers as intermediaries for them to register uh, at the very least. Okay, yeah. uh, but I think those um, those channels, uh, information systems, people information systems are still important in our context. I'd just like to add quickly, uh, you know, Erwin uh, touched on some issues. I I I I want to just re-emphasize. Open data was a big big problem for the Philippines uh, at the start. Uh, getting information down to the barangay level so that they can make changes uh, was a challenge. Uh, a, a, a second thing was the top-down approach of government. Uh, I think that that uh, led to so many uh, missteps early on. Uh, the the idea that you know um, what they say on top and what they decide on top will without co coordinating, collaborating, or communicating with uh, those at the at the lower levels would work uh, somehow uh, was a mistake. Uh, in fact, most of our surges were uh, you know. Uh, uh, were, were, were preceded by uh, edicts from above that were mindless, actually, and were very hard to implement at the local government level. One famous one was the Balik Provincia program in June, which started the first, the second surge in our country. We, we, we did not coordinate with local governments. We had no quarantine system. We just returned all the OFWs without testing and spread them around the country. Once they came home, once they finished their quarantine, we just sent them to their uh, homes, home provinces and many of them spread the uh, virus there. So again, that was a top-down, an example of a top-down, uh, uh, what you call this, edict. A second one was uh, the weakness of biosurveillance and the idea that uh, you know a government was not sharing information with the local government. They decided to open up prematurely in Feb. And that led to this very vicious third surge. And local governments were just shocked. You know, uh, uh, why are we going to open up movie houses? Why are we going to open up this? It became a major, major problem for local governments who, by the way, were fighting at, at, at the ground level and felt bad that they weren't consulted. They were just forced uh, to implement what the national government uh, was forcing them to do. And uh, you know, this is again the, the balance between life and li lives and livelihoods. Governments, the government want to open up the economy. Local governments were thinking maybe we should be more cautious because we're seeing this at the local government level. But they were not listened to. And in, during the surge, all the responsibility was given to them with very little resources. So again, this kind of top-down approach in the Philippines has to change, uh, uh, medium, medium to long term, if we're going to be able to sustain the gains we have now as far as our response to COVID? I just have a quick response to Ranjit, uh, because uh, for, for those in the audience who don't, who don't know, in the Philippines, actually, uh, healthcare is decentralized. Yeah. But the pandemic is a completely new animal. And in the context of the pandemic, the response was centralized. So yeah. uh, I think in the future, figuring out what the functional assignments of the different levels of government as far as pandemics is something worth investigating or uh, considering in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we don't have uh, yet uh, questions, but uh, let me, I, I have a question. Uh, I, I think I can start with this and hopefully we will get 
more questions uh, from the audience in the remaining time. So uh, you professors mentioned about the role of the private sector. So uh, for example, one of the things that you mentioned about the private sector is that they were in a way, probably you didn't use that word by the way, but uh, filling the gaps you know, uh, of, this, uh, of the action of the government. So the private sector in a way was a kind of helping but uh, are addressing some of the issues of this, uh, this emergency context. I feel that uh, unfortunately we don't have our panelists uh, from, from Latin America, but uh, it, it, it would be really very interesting to compare this because we have seen the same, for example, in different countries in Latin America with the private sector. No? The, so the government is, is extremely, in some cases, uh, weak or or the reality is, is, is too big for them. So yeah. my question is that uh, if the private sector is involved in the in the search of uh, solution of solutions, to what extent are we looking at like uh, some solutions that might be also like a social class oriented? It's like uh, I sometimes I feel that uh, this uh, even though this is good, of course. But for example, in the case of Mexico, people sometimes reject uh, the, the interventions of uh, the private sector because they feel that this is like a too motivated by the wealthy people, by the rich people. So my question is, do we see the same in the Philippines or can we see like a, a probably like a connection between these solutions and these interventions by the private sector and some nuances of social class in these solutions. Any comment about that? Well, yeah, you know, uh, when you talk about the private sector in the Philippines, you know, it's similar to, to probably most of Southeast Asia and probably Mexico. You know, there's the private sector made up of big business, the oligarchy, we call it in the Philippines, sure. and, and the private sector where you have small, medium scale enterprises. And many of these uh, small and medium scale enterprises uh you know uh, on their own initiative put up their own pantries put up their own uh civic or, or voluntary uh, uh you know volunteer program to, to help uh let's say jeepney drivers communities that had uh, uh you know no access to resources there were communities that really had suffered a lot because of the lockdowns and so the you know these initiatives are not huge in the sense that uh uh they're they're run by all the you know the big business and the Philippines, the same sentiment does exist that, you know, big business is uh, seen as skeptical. In fact, the reason why we also had surges were because of the arguments uh, uh, po forced by big business on government that we needed to open up. We had to open up quickly, uh, despite the fact that we had not managed transmission. The, the last two surges were largely driven by a discourse pushed by the private sector. And so while that's not apparent to most Filipinos, those of us who know the policymaking dynamics, know that the private sector has been uh, calling the shots. But the private sector also knows that for us to open up, for us to be less um, vulnerable to surges in COVID-19, and for us to quickly uh, jumpstart the reopening of the economy, we really need certain things to be done. Testing was a big thing. Testing was a very, very big area that the private sector contributed in. Uh, initially, they, they, there was a major misstep. They were pushing for uh, uh, a testing kit, no, uh, that was so inefficient and and, and uh, you know inaccurate that it caused a surge. Okay, but now they're pushing for other testing, uh, more accurate testing like RT PCR testing. They're spending that for their employees and for the communities. The private sector is also very strong in vaccination. In fact, one of the biggest uh, hauls of vaccine we're going to have in, in the next few months is a one or two million dose. Uh, uh, initiative of the private sector. They bought a mil one or two million doses of Pfizer and Moderna. And, uh, and so the private sector is providing that to the public also. They're, they're setting up massive vaccination centers. So the private sector, while self-seeking and self-serving, understand that uh, for us to move forward, we need to deal with transmissions. That, for, that, that they're all of the same conviction now because of the surge. That uh, for us to open up the economy and jumpstart jump economic recovery, we need to deal with transmissions. So now that the private sector intervention is a little more 
uh, you know, constructive, more collaborative, and in line with uh, the government's plan. Uh, they're not asking to open up quickly anymore. They saw what happened in Feb when they forced the economy to open up and uh, a surge, a very terrible surge happened. So they're very quiet now, but they're now focusing on vaccination. So there's a role for the private sector and um, uh, communities will continue to play a significant role in monitoring, in enforcing minimum public health standards and in fighting COVID in general. But uh, the more that that linkage between the civil society and the private sector and government are strengthened, uh, the more likely we will see solutions. Very good, uh, Professor Ranjit. Uh, Winston, do you have any, probably a uh, last question and uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, so um, my question is about inequality and I think class has been mentioned previously as well and the theme of inequality has also emerged in the earlier panels and interestingly throughout every panel there's talk about the urban poor and do you, in your opinion, does inequality affect um, a citizen's ability to improve their health awareness? Yep. Um, I, I think we answered that already indirectly earlier on. So because definitely inequality or of course poverty is a factor in how people comply. Like a uh, two-week lockdown is something a uh, white-collar worker can be able to survive because they can work from home. But frontliners who, uh, whose work uh, has to be physical or physical presence can definitely not afford to stay at home for two weeks. So that alone already exacerbates uh, the challenges of the pandemic. The same way not that if... Uh, Testing cost, let's say, three thousand pesos. Uh, uh, poor, poor people won't be even consider testing, and they will just isolate at home, and you won't be able to monitor them, or they they would actually try to even uh, attend work even when they're sick if they have to be paid on a daily wage. So definitely inequality, especially in uh, in poorer countries and in urban poor conditions is a, is a factor that you cannot ignore. And that's why um, subsidies or minimum wage, uh, parang universal uh, wages is something that is worth thinking about. Yeah, uh, just to build on that, you know, uh, the, the pandemic has exacerbated the divide. No? It's has exacerbated uh, social, political, and, and, and economic divides in the country. It's reinforced uh, changelessness, uh, but it's also uh, put to fore the idea that uh, the wealthy in our society need to pay back more. You know, there's now a discussion on wealth tax. I don't know if it's a discussion in Mexico, but it's a discussion in many countries now that uh, we need to uh, reallocate. Because the state has to come in and reallocate services because of the great disruption caused by uh, COVID. And yes, inequality has uh you know has been an incredible challenge no uh, as far as dealing with covid-19 uh we, we, not only has it highlighted it's worsened in the philippines 5 million families have moved back to fa to higher degrees of poverty and even hunger so it's a real problem for the philippines uh i would think that it's also a challenge for for many of our southeast asian neighbors and, and so th this is a uh, inequality is exacerbated because of this crisis, but the the response has to be an institutional one, and we have to uh, find ways uh, uh, to 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 deal with uh, to 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 breach this inequality through government reform, through economic reform, through jump starting economic growth. And this is, by the way, the argument of the economic cluster of government. That's why uh, they've been asking for. Uh, you know, an acceleration of opening up the economy because it's really costing, it's not just lives, it's also livelihoods. Uh, hunger has increased uh, in the country and we have had the worst economic uh, disruption since World War II. And uh, we, we're we seeing most um, learned, uh, what you call this, observers think that this won't just happen. This won't be resolved in the next two, three years. will take at least a decade to resolve. So, uh, you know, it's true. Yeah, it, it does matter it is uh, in fact the crux of the challenge 
And in the Philippines, a lot of the response of government has been trying to focus on how to help the poor because there's a real fear of social disruption. So that's why uh, massive uh, social amelioration packages have been set up. Uh, that's why the focus of vaccination now has been recalibrated to focus on the poor, especially the working uh, class. Uh, again, there's, there's a heightened awareness of that. But uh, their plight has been there like that even before COVID and uh, it will require a social reform, significant social reform now. Uh, after COVID because of the disruption caused by COVID. Very good. Okay, so I think uh, we have uh, just like uh, five minutes to wrap up and I think uh, we don't, probably uh, there will be more questions after this, uh, the, the, the webinar is uh, posted in our website. So uh, we would like to thank you all for joining this panel. Professor Ranjit, uh, Professor Alan Pike. And uh, it was uh, really nice to have you in, in this, in this uh, panel. Uh, your ideas and your comments were very enlightening and very interesting for us and uh, certainly for the people who will be checking these uh, uh, this, uh, webinars later on. So uh, we would like to invite you, Professor Alan Pai, Professor Ranjit, uh, for tomorrow. If you have time, it will be great uh, to, if you can join us and all the people who have been today with us, we would like to invite you to the second day of our, say, our workshop, which is Imagining the Post-Pandemic City, Shifting Conversations, uh, call, uh, Calls for Action and Critical Dialogues. Uh, we will have uh, people, of course, uh, from Southeast Asia. We will also have our uh, one colleague from Chile join on, joining us. And it will be great to, to have you all. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much all for your attendance and thank you all for your comments. And we look forward to having you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you. 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 Thank